Over the past many decades, the world grew accustomed to a bipolar, then unipolar international order, with the U.S. acting as the global enforcer. But in the three plus years since Donald Trump took office, the Stars and Stripes have shown a less predictable, less interventionist bent, frequent saber rattling with allies, warming up to dictators. With us to consider that and the future of American power, we welcome in Washington, D.C. via Skype, Hussein Ibish, senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute. In Cambridge, Massachusetts, Stephen Walt, the Robert and Renee Belfort Professor of International Relations at Harvard University and the author of The Hell of Good Intentions, America's Foreign Policy Elite and the Decline of U.S. Primacy. And here in our studio, Jenna Stein, the Bellsburg Professor of Conflict Management and founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. And Janice, lovely to have you back in that chair. And to our friends in Points Beyond in the U.S., we're glad you could spare some time for us on TVO tonight as well. I want to start with a quote from Stephen Walt's book, and that'll get us off to the races. Mr. Director, if you'd bring this up, please. The United States spent the past quarter century pursuing an ambitious, unrealistic, and mostly unsuccessful foreign policy. Having won the Cold War and achieved a position of primacy unseen since the Roman Empire, why did U.S. leaders decide to maintain a military establishment that dwarfed all others and expand an already far-flung network of allies, client states, military bases, and security commitments? Instead of greeting the defeat of its principal rival as an opportunity to reduce America's global burdens, why did both Democrats and Republicans embark on an ill-considered campaign to spread democracy, markets, and other liberal values around the world? Uh, Stephen Walt, that seems like a really good question. You want to uh, throw some answers on the table to start us off? Sure. Uh, I argue in the book that we, uh, we basically did this for two reasons. One, we were in a position to try. The United States uh, at the end of the Cold War faced no serious rivals anywhere. Uh, we were also, I think, infected with a certain degree of hubris, uh, having won the Cold War, uh, thinking that we had found the magic formula that was going to work all over the world, a set of liberal values of democracy, rule of law, human rights, et cetera. Uh, and so the United States, beginning with Bill Clinton, but continuing under George Bush and even Barack Obama, pursued a strategy that I and others have called liberal hegemony. Uh, liberal not in the sense of being, say, left wing, but liberal because it seeks to promote a set of liberal values. And it's hegemony because it believes the United States is the indispensable power that is destined to lead the world in this direction. Uh, it sounds good to us, but what we were essentially trying to do was create a global liberal order and transform other countries into replicas of the United States. Uh, force them, uh, peacefully if possible, but if necessary with force, to embrace a set of political values that we have in this country and in some other countries, but are not universally uh, welcomed around the world. And however, uh, noble our intentions may have been, uh, this strategy has been an almost complete, uh, almost total failure. Well, let me do a quick follow-up on that. It seems that every president, from Clinton to Bush to Obama and now Trump, has promised a, a more modest American foreign policy, and yet it never really seems to happen. The international entanglements continue. How come? Well, again, I think it's partly because we were in this position to do it, but also because our foreign policy establishment has become accustomed to trying to run the world. Uh, and the central theme of the book, in fact, is that this foreign policy elite actually likes trying to shape the world uh, as much as possible and is, uh, tends to be overconfident about America's ability to transform other societies. So you're exactly right. Remember that Bill Clinton ran for president uh, saying that it was the economy stupid, and George W. Bush promised a humble foreign policy, and of course Barack Obama said that he would end uh, foreign wars and concentrate on nation building at home, yet none of these presidents were able to reverse course in any significant way, and the United States remained overcommitted in projects that weren't uh, working particularly well. Shanna Stein, is it time for a more modest, more restrained American foreign policy? You know, I actually think it is, and I think it is because w the world is no longer unipolar. China is already a great power, and in another few years, its economy may, may well be larger than the United States in purchasing power capacity. 
But the reason the United States has done what it has done uh, is not quite as benign, I think, as you suggest, Steve. Uh, global Which Steve are you referring to there? Walt. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> um, that's right, sorry. Uh, global markets benefited the United States enormously. Yes, the United States paid a price, but the advantage to the American economy, the growth of its technology companies, uh, depends on widespread access to global markets. And that has been a strong driver in US foreign policy. Second reason that this kind of behavior has really continued way past its best due date is it's almost impossible um, to get legislation through Congress that has significant domestic benefit. It is so polarized, so divided, so U.S. presidents, one and all, when they're frustrated by their inability to build infrastructure, to, to improve the American education system, turn to foreign policy because they are freer of constraint when they're doing that. Hussein Ibish, how about you? Does America need a more restrained foreign policy these days? Um, more restrained than what is the question. So right. let me just say, I think both of my colleagues here have made very good points. And, and I agree with much of what both of them have said. But I uh, would differ a bit from Professor Walt in the sense that I don't see this as uh, uh, as a, a homogenous problem. I see it as a problem of extremes. And I don't see it as a post-Cold War problem as much as a post-9-11 problem. In other words, I think if you look at American foreign policy, uh, before you know, so before 9-11, between the end of the Cold War and 9-11, you see a lot of international engagement, but and and the application of force in Kuwait, in the Balkans, etc., and a lot of uh, robust diplomacy and a big international presence and military machine, but not an unrestrained foreign policy. It doesn't look like the foreign policy Professor Wald described in terms of trying to reshape uh, foreign societies in in our image or trying to impose democracy and free markets and all that. I mean, there's an encouragement of it, but that was not the point of the interventions in Kosovo or in Kuwait or anything like that. All right. Now, you switch to post-9-11, um, and you do see that, this incredibly hubristic bizarre overreaction uh, of the invasion of Iraq and the nation building, state building projects that were quixotic and doomed to failure from the outset in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and beyond. Now, under second term Obama and second term and, and first term Trump, I think we've seen a swing in the opposite direction where we maintain this huge military presence. But at least in the Middle East and, and in the Islamic world, there's a real reticence to get involved. And I think if you look at the reaction of second term Obama and Trump to Syria, uh, you see a, a, a kind of um, a phobia of, of getting involved at all and a willingness to just give the store away to minor players or second tier players like Russia who and, and as a result of this for example the United States is no longer the central diplomatic player in the Middle East despite this enormous military and economic presence Russia is the key player why because Russia asserts itself and I think there is a sweet spot in between too much hubris and, and overreaction and, and exactly what Professor Walt described, which is crazy. Okay. Let me get and some reaction from Stephen Walt on this. Yeah, yeah, let me get some reaction from Stephen Walt on this. Should, should the world, Professor Walt, go back to, or should the United States, I guess, go back to a more 1930s style isolationism, given, given what your view is, given the feedback you've had from our other two guests as well? Uh, absolutely not. And none of the people who favor a more restrained foreign policy are calling for a retreat to what you might call a genuine fortress America. The United States will want to be economically engaged around the world. Uh, the United States needs to be diplomatically engaged, in fact, more so and more effectively than it has been in recent years, when we've tended to rely much more heavily on military force and much less on diplomacy. And I believe the United States needs to be directly engaged in preventing China from dominating uh, East Asia. Uh, what the United States does need to do is uh, slowly uh, devolve its security commitments in Europe, let Europe uh, handle its own uh, affairs, and disengage uh, from the 
uh, policies it's followed in the Middle East. I did want to say, though, you know, yes, there's no question the Bush administration might have been the high water mark uh, of hubris, but it wasn't all that different under Clinton and under Obama. Uh, you'll remember in the Clinton administration, although they were very leery of large scale uh, military actions, uh, we were busy beginning to expand NATO eastward uh, without limit, and we adopted a policy in the Middle East known as dual containment, where the United States agreed to contain Iran and Iraq simultaneously. Uh, we did that, of course, and it required us to keep lots of military forces in Saudi Arabia and also in Kuwait. And that was one of the reasons that Osama bin Laden cited uh, for attacking the United States on September 11th. So there were real consequences from policies that Clinton adopted. Barack Obama, of course, ran for office saying he was going to do less. But in his first year as president, he sent more troops to Afghanistan. He reluctantly supported the intervention in Libya, which led to a failed state there. He has he tacitly uh, supported Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen as well. And he expanded the drone war in a variety of other places uh, as well. So Barack Obama was not what you would call a restrained president. He only looks that way in comparison to George W. Bush. Janice. So, well, you know, one of, the, one of the big challenges when we think about restraint in a bipolar world, if we, as we watch what China is doing, um, is where do we draw the red lines? Uh, and this has been a historic problem in great power foreign policy forever. We have examples where we say, well, we're never going to intervene with, under any circumstances in Europe with force. And then, for example, hypothetically, um, Russia takes that as a signal and says, oh, geez, the Baltics, that's fair game then, because they're never going to use force. Uh, paradoxically, signaling restraint in the way, Steve, that you're just talking about it, uh, is an open invitation you sometimes. Encourage. Yeah. And that's why. Uh, you encourage, exactly, and that's why leaders are reluctant to signal restraint in advance. It makes everybody's calculations that much harder if you're ambiguous. But then you're driven by events and you react to events. Um, and so all the restrainers are having a lot of difficulty telling us uh, where they think the United States should use force. Steve just said, oh my goodness, containing China um, in its own neighborhood which would be one of the most escalatory things that it's conceivable mm. to imagine and would risk a great power war in ways that we have not since the early 1960s. Hussein, you wanted to add. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think if you listen to what Professor Walt says about um, how every post-Cold War president has been unrestrained, you get a sense that any application of force is, is a lack of restraint from his point of view, that he basically wants and not the neo-isolation of the, of the 30s in trade terms, but the kind of neo-isolationism in terms of military engagement and military power around the world. I would argue that um, the, it would be a, a, a total overreaction to the debacle in Iraq and Afghanistan to conclude that, therefore, the application of force can never benefit the United States and the American military presence in the world in engagement can never benefit the United States. I think you can look at the, uh, the, 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 the intervention, in, for example, in Kuwait, where it was it was robust and strong to get Iraq out of Kuwait, but restrained insofar as it did not attempt either to go beyond the border into Iraq, which was very wise, nor to reshape Kuwait Kuwait society or politics, but simply to restore the status quo ante. In other words, the United States, I think, has interests in creating and maintaining and at times even intervening to enforce a rules-based order that is about balance. Uh, but if you, if you withdraw from the international community, predatory other powers will intervene. And uh, I think Americans have economic and other interests around the world that are worth defending. And I think most Americans think that, too. Uh, it's just that people are naturally traumatized because we have swung from one crazy extreme to another. So let Stephen uh, have a chance to respond to all of that. Yeah, I, actually, Hussein doesn't realize that he and I agree on this uh, point. I mean, the key question <laughs> okay, to ask is exactly where 
exactly where and under what circumstances right. it's in America's national interest to deploy military force. So certainly it was a, the right thing to do in 1991 to help uh, uh, lead a coalition to expel Iraq from Kuwait. Why? Because one of America's interests is to maintain a balance of power in the Middle East so that no single uh, country becomes so strong that it's able to dominate that entire region. Uh, similarly, that justified uh, during the Cold War our support for NATO. We didn't want the Soviet Union to dominate uh, Eastern Europe or Western Europe. We didn't want it to dominate all of uh, Eurasia. That also explained our policies in Asia during the Cold War as well. Because China is now the emerging challenger to the United States, we should be maintaining tight alliances and, in fact, if possible, uh, making them more robust in East Asia, not to cause a war there, but simply to force or make sure that China is not able to intimidate uh, its neighbors there, not able to establish a dominant in position in Asia that might allow it to project power into other parts of the world. The point is you have to have some reasons uh, or an right. underlying strategic logic to explain when sure. you're going to commit the United States to uh, possibly fight. And I just say the, the difficulty is that if you think the United States should be committed to preventing aggression in every particular corner of, of the world, you end up with a situation we're in today where the United States tends to be uh, engaged almost everywhere or if we're well, not engaged, people immediately start complaining that America's reputation is uh, being undermined, that we're encouraging aggression. The point is you have to ask which well, parts of the world yeah. are sufficiently important, sufficiently vital right. that the United States should commit to send its own sons and daughters right. potentially to uh, to fight and die for those. And I would argue that the United States is relatively secure and most of our attention needs to be focused on Asia now, not on the Middle East, and over time, not on Europe, which is in fact wealthy enough to defend itself if it ever gets serious about that prospect. Yes. You know, when you think about the world, Steve, that we're coming, both Steves, that we're coming <laughs> into, there's a strong argument to be made that. Um, particularly East Asia, is just China's backyard, just as Latin America was yeah. the United States' backyard. So if we're truly restrained, why don't we recognize spheres of influence and say, this is China's backyard, yeah, that's yours. Does that include Japan? Yeah, it includes Taiwan. It Korea? Inclu Vietnam? Yes, Korea. This is China, you know, the, just like Mexico, Venezuela, that's the United States' so bring backyard. So bring all the troops home from South Korea? Well, if we're really going to be restrained, then we're going to recognize that we no longer, the United States no longer has an, uh, a remit uh, to challenge everywhere in the world. Why doesn't the argument of restraint encompass spheres of influence, which is, in fact, the way the 19th century worked uh, and the Cold yeah. War worked? Can I, can I put a... I mean, you've asked a rhetorical question. Let me throw a rhetorical answer out there. Because the status quo has essentially kept the peace in, in the Koreas for 70 years. Why would you want to mess exactly. with that? Well, you know, so this is, in fact, the problem with these restraint arguments. It's disingenuous a little bit to say we need to engage seriously with Asia, diplomatically for sure. But that's not what's at stake here. We have a rising China that is, in fact, saying to everybody, this is our backyard. And when you engage seriously, as we did with the Soviet Union, there is a real risk of a major war. And that's the part of the argument that we don't make clear enough when we're talking about it. Hmm. Hussein, can I put this question to you? Could I All ask? All right, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, I can't tell if you think the United States should be engaged in Asia or not. I, uh, do you think the United States should retreat to isolationism militarily? Uh, no, I do not. But I think we have to be much more circumspect um, about what reasonable limits are, and we have to be much more careful about recognizing what China's real interests are in that part of the world. And it's not at all clear to me that demonstrations of force um, in China's backyard are an intelligent foreign policy for the United States. That's not to say that the United States doesn't have major interests, but there is this quality. We're going to pick in the restrainer argument, and that's not always true about you, Steve, but it is about others. We're going to pick the areas. It's Asia. We're going to turn our back on the rest of the world. But what that argument does not do is openly acknowledge the high risk of military confrontation with a power that can inflict serious damage on the United States. Let me, let me make uh, two points here, if I might. One is, 
there, there's a different approach that's possible to the application of power once we agree to do it. I mean, obviously, Professor Walt and I would probably make different judgments. We agree there needs to be a more serious, you know, sort of standard. Right. Fine. Uh, but I think if you're going to hold out the option, you need to maintain a robust global profile or you won't be able to do it. Now, what's necessary, I think, is to learn from others who have shown recently, uh, reminded us of the success, the why we were successful in Kuwait in 1991, which is that we had a very narrow, specific, well-defined goal, and we applied only so much force as necessary to achieve that very narrow goal. You look at the way that Russia, for all of the moral problems that it brings has uh, conducted itself in Syria. It's been it's been very immorally, but it defined a very narrow goal, the survival of the Assad regime in part of Syria, only part of it, and applied very little force and has emerged as a central player, not only in Syria, but in the Middle East in general, with the loss of a few hundred lives, a couple of aircraft, and uh, a few billion rubles. It's a, it's a huge uh, benefit to a small cost, precisely because the goal was narrow and defined and the means were, uh, were very limited, right? That's important. It's easier, of course, for a dictatorship to do that mm -hmm. than for a democracy, because there's no argument in Russia about what Russia wants. The United States needs, obviously, a clearer um, sense of purpose and, and uh, you know, a process that's better at defining goals, you know, in order to do that. But I think that's what's really the corrective. Let me ask Stephen Walt a direct question then. Do you think it would be in the interests of the United States and, let's say, world peace to have the U.S. take all of its military interests out of the Middle East right now? Um, Pretty much. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't want to do it precipitously. And if we had been more intelligent, I think, under the Trump administration, we would have been working much harder to try and stabilize a number of different situations uh, as America uh, began to dis, uh, disengage. But yes, I would return to the policy the United States followed from roughly 1945 to roughly the early 1990s. We had interests in the Middle East, we had partners there, but the United States did not have substantial military forces in the Middle East from 1945 to 1991, with the exception of some rather short-lived and small-scale interventions in Lebanon. Uh, we relied on local powers to maintain a, a balance of power in the region, um, and we helped them at various times, but we didn't do it with our own forces. Uh, and that policy, while not perfect, uh, worked actually pretty well for the United States. So I would be trying to minimize the American military footprint, if not entirely to zero, and I would stop trying to tell Middle Eastern countries uh, what to do. I might add the United States should not have the Please. current situation we have in the Middle East where we give unconditional support to some countries like Saudi Arabia or Israel or Egypt, and we don't even talk to countries like Iran. Uh, I agree with Hussein uh, that, um, that Russia had a very finite, limited objective in Syria, and that's one of the reasons they were more successful. But it's also worth noting that Russia and China talk to everybody in the Middle East. We yeah, only talk to some countries, and we tend to back them we tend to back them no matter what they do, which encourages reckless behavior on their part. Let me just do a quick so follow-up with quick you. Point. Hang on, hang on a sec, Hussein, I, I need to know this. Okay, troops out of the Middle East, I understand. What about the billions in military and or civilian aid that the United States gives to Israel, to Egypt, to other countries in the area? What would you do about that? I would be making that aid much more conditional on those countries taking actions that are consistent with what the United States wants. Uh, in the case of Israel, that would be reversing its uh, attempts to create essentially a, a one-state solution there, uh, support for the two-state solution that all American presidents until Trump uh, have supported, um, and also being much more conditional with our support for Saudi Arabia. Okay, if that were American policy, I want to get some feedback from our other two guests now on how you think that would go down. Hussein, go ahead. Well, yeah, I mean, if you want to have a balancing policy, I would certainly support a balancing policy. I think that's the right thing to do. But the balancing policy would, ha I think, have to involve, first of all, you'd have to 
to work towards creating a more stable environment. Right now, there's no chance of a balance of power in the Middle East because you're not only talking about Iran. You're talking about this network of Iranian sectarian militias in multiple key Arab countries like Iraq and Syria and Lebanon and uh, Yemen and elsewhere that have really destabilized the region. So you'd have to work with others to create a situation where you're balancing between states and not non-state actors. And this is this is really is, I think, an American problem because it's very directly linked to terrorism and very directly linked to instability that threatens Europe, ultimately threatens the United States. That's my first point. My second point is it's not about telling people what to do. If you want to play a balancing role, ultimately you're going to have to be creating, I think, a mechanism to enforce a rules-based order. That's the only way it's going to work, right, if you if you want to really balance. It's not just about having equal forces on either side. I think if it's going to be viable and sustainable, there's got to be a set of standards that you hold everybody to. And I agree, you don't unconditionally support one side and, and open up needless conflicts with another. But you do have to have a set of standards. And I think the, the thing that really has sent the Middle East into a chaotic situation now is this plethora of of non-state militias, which are cancers on multiple Arab states. And uh, until that issue is resolved, it's going to be very hard for any balance or any balancing policy to succeed. Janice? Well, I, all I can say to this discussion is non-state actors are a part, not only of the Middle East, but almost anywhere else in the world that we look at, and they are not going away. So focusing in, entirely on balance of power among states is, uh, sadly, a look in the rearview mirror. It's not a look exactly. toward the future. Secondly, the idea of conditional development assistance that you put on the table, Steve, is one that many presidents of the United States have tried and all have failed. Because? Because um, the governments in, in, in place either accept the aid and then go ahead and do what they want anyway mm -hmm. and understand the domestic leverage they have, whether it's Saudi Arabia or, or Israel, um, to, to um, blunt criticism. Or, frankly, because there are, these are important assets and important allies. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen for the last 40 years, if not longer, is the tail wags the dog rather than the other yeah. way around. So it's not that I disagree well, with Steve Wald. It's just not practical, frankly. Well, OK. Also, the Saudis don't get aid. The Saudis yeah. buy weapons. So yeah, if you want right. to have Steve's <laughs> kind of mercantile policy, you'd, you'd want yeah. to quintuple that, I would imagine. We're literally down to our last couple of minutes here. And Stephen Wald, I guess I want to give you a chance to, to speak to the question of whether you think the world, given Given how dangerous a place the world is today, do we still need an international policeman? And if so, is that the U.S.? Uh, the answer is there is no international policeman, uh, certainly not the United Nations, and it shouldn't be the United States. And I think the record of the last 25 years tells you uh, why. The United States has not been a particularly good policeman over the last 25 years. To just take the Middle East, which we've been talking about, the United States has been a more disruptive presence in the Middle East than all the non-state actors uh, put together, it seems to me. After all, it was wow. our invasion of Iraq in 2003 that eliminated one of the checks against Iran, that led to the emergence of ISIS eventually, that reinforced the the jihadi idea that the United States was uh, fundamentally anti-Islam, which of course I think is not true, but it certainly uh, made it look that way. And of course, we've not done a particularly good job of stabilizing places like Afghanistan as well, despite being there for almost 20 years. Um, the United States can be a stabilizing force in certain circumstances. We've been good at deterring aggression in Europe uh, mm -hmm. in the past during the Cold War. I think the United States played a stabilizing role in Asia throughout the Cold War. But in other parts of the world, American activity and our attempts in particular to try and move these countries to become more like the United States in various ways has generally backfired at considerable cost. Uh, when things go south, as they did in Indochina, as they have in Afghanistan, as they did in Iraq, the United States eventually disengages. I think the United States will need to be much more selective about where it chooses to commit its military power, work much more closely with local 
partners, particularly in Asia, um, and generally uh, view military force as a last resort rather than its first impulse. And that is our time. We need to get the three of you back together again. That was a good and civilized exchange of views. Uh, our thanks to Stephen Walt uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. A reminder, uh, for more on this, read his book, The Hell of Good Intentions. Hussein Ibish uh, from the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, D.C., and Janice Stein from the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the U of T. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.